This show is proudly sponsored by TraderCobb.com, the leaders in checklist-based trading strategy. Yes, that's exactly how it sounds. I'll teach you a literal checklist so you can tick off items and be decisive very quickly. Get across to TraderCobb.com where there's a bunch of free content there for you to have a look at. And of course, if you're interested in having me come to your city, click and register for the live events coming up and filling fast. Have a great day. Visit TraderCobb.com now. The Trader Cobb Crypto Show, talking business in blockchain. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Trader Cobb Crypto Show. We've got a returning guest. Yes, that's right. I met this gentleman in Dubai at the WBS event out there met some great people after spending some time with Ali it's Ali Madhavji who is the managing partner of the blockchain founders fund he's coming to us from Singapore this is a man who travels all around the world speaking to all the different conferences so I'm looking forward to seeing what he sees that's going on in the space right now so thank you so much for your time Ali thanks so much Craig for having me back on the show Mate, I've been looking forward to this because Look, there's no one I know that travels as much as you. Um, you are at all the events, man. You're speaking to a lot of people. You're very connected in this space. Where have you been lately? What, where have your travels taken you? So, so all over the world. So I do travel 100%. Uh, I've been back to North America uh, already this year. I've been uh, in Europe and in the Middle East and also across Asia. So, you know, anywhere from, you know, South Korea to Singapore, Taiwan, a second time as of next week, this year, um, even uh, some of the work that we're doing with blockchain in mainland China, uh, the Middle East, and uh, around Europe and North America, with some of the work that we're doing with the United Nations, and then we've got portfolio companies in five continents. And so it, it adds up to quite a bit of travel. <laughs> Uh, you must, I mean, you must, they must look at your frequent flyer card when you walk up and just go, whoa, you must be like a rock star <laughs> yeah. to the travel, travel agents. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's definitely not too bad. I have to say. But, uh, you're a busy man. There's no doubt about that at all. So first question about where you've been. I mean, it, obviously look, we've, we've seen price go pretty crazy the last, well, the last week or two, it's really kicked into overdrive. Um, but since about, what was it, back in April, we saw that break up through four and a half thousand. And we kind of been looking at a much more positive market since then. Of course, 6,000 didn't blip. There, there was no sell orders there. I was watching it thinking everyone's talking about 6,000, but no one's acting because there was no orders there. And we've continued to see the, 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 the market drive uh, and move forward in terms of price. Have you seen, is there any... I guess a city at the moment in the, in the, in your most recent travels as the market has started to come back looking more bullish that have been, I guess, more interested, more excited, more involved or anything along those lines. Like who, who's at the forefront? Who's the most excited at the moment out there uh, across your travels? I mean, we're, we're definitely seeing from, you know, where we've been recently a lot more interest for sure. I mean, conferences are having, more and more people show up at them. I, I still don't think it's the same as when we were in the peak, but you know, you are seeing, you know, pretty full crowds. You're seeing a lot more interest as well from traditional funds coming back in and looking at the space more closely. So we are seeing that a little bit. Um, there's been, of course, a lot of conversation with, you know, major announcements related to blockchain and cryptocurrency. I mean, the Facebook thing um, with Libra, you know, you've got, businesses that are not even blockchain talking about it right and so the, these sorts of things are definitely adding a lot a lot more interest um and then you've seen an emergence again of ieos uh mm -hmm. similar to icos getting a lot more strength um you know in recent months so that's another case where you're seeing continued interest coming into projects in that way and what's your thought? I mean, you talk about traditional funds starting to be a lot more interested in the space. And I guess that sort of coincides with what I've been seeing, which is the CME futures volume increasing. Um, you know, for, for funds to get involved properly, they need to have a derivative product that's got some volume. Uh, otherwise, they can't hedge themselves and they can't effectively work within a market, especially not a market that, has, that does carry so much volatility. I mean, even if they're going to look to have a small fund of funds, uh, you know, inside of the space, let's just say it's $100 million, which is 
it's, it's small in traditional land, um, they need to be able to get positions that are going to hedge themselves. So the CME volumes going through the roof recently has been a really positive thing for in institutional involvement in my eyes. When you're having these conversations with these types of um, fund managers, what's their biggest issue around entering into the space? And what sort of things they're looking out for? Yeah, so, so there's a couple of uh, points on that. So before I get to that, I mean, there's, there's, of course, both the cryptocurrency side and playing on that side. And then there's funds looking at getting exposure as well to the blockchain side. And that ah. they don't necessarily need a different mandate, right? Yes. So there is both of those parts uh, to, be, to be conscious of. But on the cryptocurrency side, I mean, you are looking at, of course, uh, better custody solutions and, and, and Coinbase. And, and there's been a number of other like BitGo and other solutions have been doing uh, a decent job here, but um, you know, I think there's still a lot of opportunity for you know world class level custody solutions that is still being built out in this industry. Um, so that's definitely one of the challenges. I think one of the other reasons why there's been this increased interest in cryptocurrency, and I think, is really coincided, or, or in my opinion, propelled. Mm -hmm. Um, the price of Bitcoin has been essentially these trade wars and the slowing economy and concerns uh, around essentially what's what's going on globally. And I think that's definitely having an impact on creating additional nerves on the economy, additional concerns on potentially certain wars that might be looming and, you know, increased um, printing or quantitative easing, um, which you're seeing certain federal or central banks now you know, changing their policies a little bit around, uh, you know, interest rates and even looking at, you know, whether or not there might be further cuts, et cetera. So there's a lot of factors at play that are coinciding with um, additional entries, especially in, in, in Bitcoin. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually, because, um, I mean, people talk about, often they talk about uh, Bitcoin being a hedge. Uh, I think that that's probably a power, maybe a too strong a word. Uh, to use, I mean, a hedge is something that you were willing to go into quite heavily. Like gold has been a has been a hedge, and we've seen gold move as well, um, very strongly. As a matter of fact, gold has had a very good surge lately. Again, uh, around the mm -hmm. conflict situations and whatnot, we see interest rates continue to drop. Um, you meant to rise interest rates in a strong economy, so it's a, it's a worrying sign. And it's not just like if I talk to Australia when the GFC hit in two thousand and eight. We, we had interest rates about 7.5%. So we had a long way to cut to survive it. Uh, of course, now we're getting down into the lowest interest rates we've ever seen in this country. And across Europe and in America, we're seeing very you know, record levels, uh, also records set by low interest rates. It doesn't bode well for the future with you know, massive stock market gains and massive debt. Um, do you think that there is the possibility that if there is a perfect storm, and I, I suggest that there will be some catalyst uh, event that will drive the prices down. I, I can really see another uh, quite special, wrong word, um, but a, a, a big event um, as far as in our history of markets, because they, they, they don't tend to go up for this long for as strong. Uh, they need to have pullbacks and um, something's going to give. Do you think there's a possibility that we could see a lot more money coming into uh, Bitcoin and the crypto asset space if we were to say, see that war with Iran kick off uh, and a few other things just tip bounce slightly. Do you think we'll see a flood of money coming in or will they just go to cash? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I personally do think that there's uh, growing tensions globally that will actually propel Bitcoin. And we've actually been talking about this for, for years on a looming uh, recession in the US that could, you know, be very severe, but then also increasing wars and, you know, no end in sight really on this debt ceiling and, and where it's going in the US and, and a number of other countries, right? And so uh, personally, I do think that that is uh, a, a big catalyst. And when you do have one of these things really hit and settle in, you know, I think that a lot of people are going to going to be looking towards Bitcoin as a way to diversify, right? And, you know, when you take gold, I think it, it is also uh, an interesting and, and useful tool for diversification. So I'm not actually against necessarily the gold uh, trade either. The, the one problem that you might see sometimes with gold, though, is the companies that mine gold are actually susceptible to the exact problems that they're trying to hedge against, right? So if you talk yeah. about a global financial crisis or another, another crisis, the companies actually mine gold will have a liquidity crunch because they won't be able to access credit to actually fund their operations and therefore may actually shut down even while the price of gold may theoretically supposed to be going up, right? And, and maybe going up. And so 
this is where um, there's, it's, it's a little bit odd when you look at how gold hedges um, essentially the economy, but the gold companies are actually susceptible to that economy. Yeah, which I suppose would drive the supply and demand even higher and make gold worth even more for those that own physical bullion. Because, I mean, if you own the physical, well, you've at least got your gold. If I own a shares in, shares in a company, I own part of the gold that's in the ground, but that gold's in the ground. So I'm not going to go get my shovel and start digging for it. So I, it's an interesting uh, perspective mm -hmm. to bring that, yeah, a loot, like if we did see um, financial Armageddon of sorts, uh, yeah, those companies are going to be you know, due to the same, they're gonna have the same risk as every other company because the company's a company. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be really interesting to see what actually goes on there. So that is, that's quite fascinating. Now you've also um, obviously been around for, for what happened with Libra. Now I wanna to talk to you briefly about that because I know you're pretty switched on with all things uh, technology and uh, and also you speak with a lot of people about, it. I'm sure it is the buzz at the moment. It's about as good a promotion of our space as you possibly could get. It's legitimized um, and brought back to the attention of a lot of people. Now they're probably doing their KYC and their AML right now. So we might start to see some of that money trickling in over the next few days, who knows, but it's a good, good thing. What do you think about Libra itself and Facebook? Facebook, right? The company that knows more about me than I do. What do you think about them yeah. going into the financial system? Of sorts, I suppose. Yeah, so 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 I, I mean I, I think it's 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 both exciting and you know can be concerning at the same time, right? So I think it's exciting for this space to see, you know, a major company, you know, basically try to push cryptocurrency to the forefront. I mean, personally I've been seeing people that have no idea about anything about blockchain or cryptocurrency and companies um, that have everyday workers talking about, you know what Facebook's doing. So, so there is that um, benefit. I think the challenge is, is question whether or not this really follows the principles of a lot of the cryptocurrencies out there, right? And so this won't be borderless. Um, I mean, you will have, of course, um, restrictions on transferability and you won't probably be necessarily owning your own, you know, coins if, they say you don't, or if someone wants to step in like some sort of regulator. And so, yeah. um, so there, there is still some challenges with this. I do think it will also be more difficult than maybe people perceive around Facebook's ability to um, really, uh, like I, th I think they'll do well, obviously it's a big company, they've got big presence, but I, I don't think like overnight it's gonna be, you know, Libra coin is everywhere across, you know, 100 countries. Um, it is actually, we, we do a lot of work with actually the United Nations on um, financial inclusion and trying to help bank the underbanked and unbanked. And one of the, the important parts is going to be, you know, actually getting this to cash, right? And, and cash points are actually very important when you start talking about unbanked and underbanked. And, and this is one of the key things that um, Facebook said they're, they're trying to tackle, right? And so, I mean, it'll be interesting to see whether or not Facebook looks at partnerships with companies like Western Union to, to get cash points or, or other types of companies. Um, and then the remittance market, of course, um, is something we're working pretty closely on. And this will be a, a key part of this, right? And one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals that we're working towards is to bring um, remittance costs below 3%. And you see in a lot of developing countries, you know, this can range, um, you know, to 10, 15, even 20% because of the fraud and other problems with, um, with, with remittances and then actually getting it to cash. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But for, for Facebook to do this, they'll probably need to create quite a few partnerships. And that'll mean that there'll need to be pretty like reasonably high fees still to actually fund that entire system. Um, and so, I wonder kind of still where it'll exactly fall in terms of, you know, affordability and, you know, maximizing the amount of money uh, for the people that need it most, right? When they need to pay for their kids' education or need to pay for food on the table or, or those sorts of things. So um, definitely keeping an eye to see how that plays out um, and, you know, we'll see. But at the end of the day, um, if it even helps millions of people and brings down the fees and makes the system a little bit more competitive, even if it's not, you know, a full blockchain uh, system doesn't follow all the principles. If it is helping millions of people, I will still be a fan of it, right? No, I mean, absolutely. then we can work on doing even more and, and bringing, you know, and bringing this down even more, which cryptocurrency in its true form would have the ability to, but at least this will give us a start. So 
Um, it'll, it'll definitely be something we're keeping an eye on pretty closely though. And what do you think about the, the chances of actually getting it? And they're talking about 2020, uh, which that's not very far away. Let's be honest. This is this we're mm-hmm. back into the sixth month of the year. Can you believe that? Um, you know, I mean, they've got to get it. Like, didn't I think five hours after they released the white paper, Congress came out to block it. No surprises there. They've got some pretty big battles to wage, right? Or, or is it that the, 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 the Congress can basically say what they want, but it's like, well, we're our own company. We can do what we want within this framework. I mean, they've, there's a lot of money they're going to have to spend even just to get the thing passed as being relevant or allowed. What do you, what, what do you foresee there? I, I can't see it being out in six months. I can see it taking a hell of a lot longer than what they first might have thought. So, so I think it will take long. I think the advantage that Facebook has, of course, has that reach. And then they do have these partners already, right? So they got Visa as a node, I believe. And they've got um, a number of other companies like PayPal, which is, you know, I'm a, I'm ex PayPal. And, and so that they do have some interesting partnerships uh, there as part of their nodes and that they could kind of use to roll out in an expedited way across certain countries. Um, but I, but I do think one of the challenges is of course uh, Congress. And I think, um, the one of the, the things that I think not enough people are talking about actually is that statement, um, I believe, as part of their presentation, where uh, they basically said that this is to replace the US dollar. And that actually adds a lot of risk, um, or it's going to be kind of the new digital US dollar, right? And, yeah. and I think that this adds a lot of risk to Facebook, you know, obviously being a public US company. It's a and so, statement to make. It, 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 it is, right? Because there's not actually that much value for a public company saying that. Like if they wanted to do it, they could just do it. And then, you know, that takes a long time and, you know, the world will kind of see later, right? But they made their um, clear, too clear. It may, maybe, right? Because now I believe July 17th, they uh, have a Congress uh, hearing um, on Libra. And I'm pretty sure that the U.S. is going to dig more into this, um, you know, not too many people have fared too well saying they're going to try to replace the U S dollar, um, in, in sorts of public roles. Right. Uh, um, and so we're, it'll be interesting to kind of follow what happens on that and how hard the U S comes after it, not necessarily only on that point, but they have a lot of other things to go after Facebook on mm. that, you know, could, could slow this project down. So with the blockchain founders fund, are you guys actively, uh, investing at the moment or are you sort of positioned quite well and you're sitting back and if you were to invest what what sort of areas are you looking at at the moment from uh, from your point of view as being the next i don't know if it's the next wave depending on your your, you know, your um, investment outlook but um, what, what sort of areas are you seeing as being of interest at the moment yeah no so so we actually are have been quite active um so we've actually got uh two funds. And so we've got a uh, blockchain founders fund. We've got another fund where we're an LP on and we're soon actually launching a, a third fund uh, over the last year uh, combined between our funds. We've had over 60 plus investments. Um, so it's been quite active um, in terms of the cryptocurrency side. We, we did actually spend a lot of time over the last year just to continue to accumulate uh, more and more BTC and ETH where we thought, you know, there's a lot of value and we saw those kind of being, the leaders um, in in a recovery, um, and I think that's worked out quite well uh, so far with with how that's gone over the last few months. And then on the other side, from the investment side, we're typically looking at equity in companies. Yeah. Uh, so it's equity in in blockchain related companies, and so we're looking for. I mean, a lot of the standard stuff that VCs are looking for, and then the differentiation points that we have are looking for companies that we believe can transform their industries with very strong product market fit. So we want to make sure that these products actually have market validation. They are solving clear pain points. They have very strong tech teams to avoid major tech delays. And then we're looking at things like good governance and ethics. So we're making sure that they've got proper lockup periods or vesting periods on founders and executives um, and these sorts of things that um, we want to make sure instilled so that we're in for the long run, but they are as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that kind of makes sense. I mean, you, you're in the position if you're taking on equity where you can actually see what's going on 
uh, as opposed to a lot of a lot of people. You know, a blockchain company doesn't necessarily need to issue a token. I just want to make that very clear to everybody that mm-hmm. just because it's a blockchain company doesn't doesn't mean that they need to go out publicly to raise. They're not doing an IEO, an ICO, or whatever you, whatever other form of raising STO uh, pops up in the next two weeks uh, or throughout this next run. Um, it's an interesting position to be because you can actually look at it like a business, which is very difficult to do on those token side of things. It is very much a speculator's market. I got no problem with that as a trader. That's kind of what I dig. That's what I do. That's where I make my crust, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty cool with that. One of the things um, I'm finding interesting at the moment is that when this market moves, it's not really having a breath. It's not breathing. It's not, it's going up and then it's just holding for a little bit. It's not really having a proper pullback. Now I've looked at some of the things like the Google Bitcoin trend, uh, in 2017, we saw, of course, that spike like an absolute mm-hmm. mad dog. Uh, and since then, um, you know, it's come right off and it still hasn't increased. So we, we seem to be a long way from that FOMO point. Based on that, it would seem justified that we could see all time highs and some really spectacular moves leading into the end of the year. What are your thoughts around that? I know it's not really, it's, it's, I'm not asking for a price prediction. I'm just saying, <laughs> but you see this continuation with all things said. Um, that's out there publicly right now and with what you know are you able to sort of think think to the future of a a, a twenty thousand dollar plus bitcoin in 2019 yes or no yeah so 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 we we don't make price predictions but we we have come out and said um from our internal side the way that we're looking at it at blockchain founders fund you know because we do have you know pretty vast uh crypto holdings as well you know, we, we do think that we're looking probably at early 2020 to hit all time highs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of course, it would be great if it was before that. Um, but but we've been pretty bullish um, on on this recovery. And, and, you know, even when, you know, people were, were very depressed, we were still at conferences, we were still spreading the word, we were still, you know, sharing a lot of the value. And, and we had a lot of our companies also heads down on just building solutions, right? And And those you're starting to see you know, really, you know, build interest, create value uh, today as a lot of these solutions are starting to roll out. Um, and so it is pretty exciting. But of course, on the other hand, you've had a lot of main net delays and you've had still a lot of uh, companies that, you know, aren't, say, creating enough value for what they've raised out of their ICO. And so we're hoping to see more and more value created, you know, getting rid of a lot of these delays. And I think, as you start to see more of these products being able these these infrastructure layers, you know, going live or improving their tools, you'll see more dApps essentially being built on it, which is really where anyone will actually interact with, mm-hmm. right? Because they'll typically interact with, uh, like the average person will typically interact on the on the dApp level, and so that'll help to build interest um, in this. And and I hope that it's you know not just this 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 pump and dump type of 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 spike but we do want you know good long steady growth in this um and not just you know continuing past all-time highs and crashing uh back down so. sustainable growth is what we want to see this time around i don't necessarily need to go see the market go straight up I, i'm really happy to see it climb uh, give me plenty of opportunities to trade uh, parabolic moves are they're much more difficult to read and, and be involved in um, mm-hmm. Look, even if I am already positioned, I mean, I've been positioned long Bitcoin for a while now with, with margin. Uh, it's been great, but I, I just want more. Like, I just want to keep layering and layering. And that's how you make a big buck in a market mm-hmm. like this. You don't know when you're going to get the trades, but if you take them and you scale out, you manage your risk and it, it does run, well, all of a sudden you end up with a 5% total portfolio position long and it's all in profit. You know, you've got no it, risk. And then all of a sudden the thing moves $2,000 in a day and you are laughing all the way to the bank. So I would prefer for it to just slow down a little bit, give us a few more entries, start acting a little bit more like a market that, uh, that we're familiar with. So Ali, look, it's been an absolute pleasure once again, taking your time. Thank you very much. And um, look, where are you off to next? So I'm off to Taiwan to speak at the Asia Blockchain Summit uh, next week. Wow. And where can people find out more information about you and what you do, mate? Yeah. So, I mean, definitely check us out on our website, blockchainff.com. You can also follow me on Twitter, Ali underscore Madabjian. We can share that in the, uh, in the notes. And, uh, and I know you, you also subscribe to this, uh, this methodology, but the way that we always work is, you know, just working on accumulating more BTC and ETH in those terms and not in USD terms. I mean, you know, we've been saying this throughout the bear market and that's been our philosophy and, you know, it's, it's worked out well, but you know, thinking about it in that term, I think is also, 
you know, very valuable for traders. And I know that's kind of how you tend to look at things as well. That's exactly right. We've got to be trading to build our sats. That's the plan. Mm-hmm. And we can always bring it into dollars. So uh, trade. There we go. Up. I can help you with that, ladies and gentlemen. I'll even have you. Thank you so much once again for your time. Safe travels. And we will speak to you again down the track. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks. Mate. All right. See you later, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day. Bye for now. This show is proudly sponsored by TraderCobb.com, the leaders in checklist-based trading strategy. Yes, that's exactly how it sounds. I'll teach you a literal checklist so you can tick off items and be decisive very quickly. Get across to TraderCobb.com where there's a bunch of free content there for you to have a look at. And of course, if you're interested in having me come to your city, click and register for the live events coming up and filling fast. Have a great day. Visit TraderCobb.com now.